Okay, so Medial 4.0, I'm going to run through this now. I'm going to do a session on scaling off that and go through the product roadmap. I think you know we're going to be done just after three realistically, which is great. You know, nice early finish in London. You can go and do some shopping or come with us to the pub. So, intro into this. As I said earlier, we've changed from this kind of real networks uh, setup um, with Helix, and now it's just us that are doing it, streaming in the UK, the global customer base. And we've gone from Helix Media Library to Medial, just to reiterate what I said earlier. And then the other things, again, just to prompt you, these are the new, this is the new stuff that we've got. Um, the new website, the new help site, uh, the support portal remains exactly the same, although it looks slightly different. And then most people, when they email us, to be honest, they email support at streaming.co.uk. That will change soon to support at medial.com, but support at streaming.co.uk will redirect anyway. So you can keep doing that if you want to, if you're particularly attached to the .co.uk. Um, when you say .co.uk to anyone in America, they have no idea what you're talking about. That's why we're changing it. So you have to say it .co.uk or else nobody, nobody knows what .co.uk is. So we're going to change to .com. And then, as I said, we've now got US presence as of November of this year. Will the video play this time, hopefully? Yes. Media Not very loud, though. Larger quantities by educators and in the enterprise. <laughs> Medial is a media management system that provides an all-in-one solution to help organizations handle this increasing throughput and demand. The definition of medial describes something that is situated in the middle and our name defines perfectly what we do. Medial can act as your enterprise YouTube and sit in between those that want to publish content and those that want to view it. Within the virtual learning environment, Medial sits in between teachers and students, allowing the creation of video-based assignments and submission of video for assessment in industry-leading systems like Blackboard and Moodle. Medial can also provide the bridge between lecture capture systems and classes of students by facilitating one-click big red button recording. strategy is and whoever is producing and viewing your content let medial be at the center of what you do this little promo video we actually had dave who's filming today did the voiceover in his lovely bbc english voice <laughs> and then we got it done by uh, an american woman as well so yeah we got two versions of that one <laughs> So the other thing uh, we've got, uh, yeah, obviously to re reiterate what I said uh, before, we've made this migration from Helix Media Library with Helix Server to Medial with Wowzer Streaming Engine. So V4, the major things that we've done in V4. The first thing is live streaming, and that's what I'm going to show you now. If I can get it working Ooh, from my phone. So as well as having... Uh, video on demand content, we now have uh, the ability to do live channels within media, and you can see this kind of live now button. So let's show you that workflow. So can you go full screen browser, Dave? I might, if I bring that across like that, does that look any better? Right. So how does it work? Is that off the Mm. Yeah? Okay. So, what do you do to get a live stream working within Medial? It's only something that an admin can do at the moment. Go into the new live streaming section, which is just here. And there are some settings to fill out. So. 
The, this is the default uh, streaming server that you will be using for e every one of your live streams that you're doing. So every time you set up a live channel, these are the default values that it uses. You can use whatever streaming server you like to do the live stream, but these are just the default ones. And these default ones are the Wowser server that is running your medial systems. That's why it's the default one. And then setting up a live channel, I'll show you one that I've already set up. This is my live channel here. So you fill out a title, a description. You decide the category that you want uh, Medial to archive the content into. So I've got a category called Streaming Limited Archive Live. You decide whether you want to enable the channel, i.e. show it in the front end, whether you want it to archive the content or not, because you might not want it to archive. For example, somebody might be doing like a you know student radio station or something that they don't necessarily want to be archived. You can, if you want, some people have done this, you can decide, actually, I just want to use Medial as a means of displaying a live feed that I'm doing somewhere else. So you can put in some custom embed code. So I've had people, just to give you an example of that, where they're doing what's called a multicast, which is where they're using uh, another player other than JW player to display a multicast stream or, or within Medial, and they want to use their custom embed code to put it in there. So I've seen people doing that with VLC player, for example, and they want to put a, a VLC player within the page. Then you put in the server name. This is just filled in by default. It's your default um, Wowser server. The mount point or application that Wowser's using. So by default, Wowser has this thing called live. It's just the thing that goes on the end of the URL. The port that it's using, again, by default, it's this 1935. Now, this is the bit here that we're going to concentrate on. So this is the stream name that is created on the fly by the medial system when setting up a live stream. So this is what you need to put into your um, transcode, uh, your encoder, rather. So I'm going to show you this, if I can get my thing to play ball. Oop. Oh, it's <laughs> I pressed the button, it started already. Right. Let me show this to you. Ah, oh, come on. There we go. Airplay. If I... Never works when you want it to. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to show you my iPhone on my computer screen, but it's not playing ball. Never does when you want it to work, does it? Right. Quit that. It's probably because I'm not connected. No, I am. What a pain. And who said Apple stuff always works? Somebody did. No? Okay. I'm not going to be able to show you that. So on my phone, I'm going to have to take it as red I'm doing this. I'm going to set up a live stream using this thing called a Go Coder. So, I'll show it to you here. So, th this is just a live streaming encoder that's working on my phone. And the settings I can put in here. So, if I click on this button, I know you can't see it very well. It would have been really nice to show it on my computer. But you, you essentially, what you do is you put in all of the settings that are on this page. So, the server name and the port, the stream name the account that I've got, 
that's also thing. Yeah. So that's all in there. So I've got all of these settings in my phone now. I'm going to click go to start the stream. So this is what you would do with your, you know, your live event. You'd be streaming it. My camera's got a bit of a smudge on it. <clears throat> I can decide what I want to do with the embed code, with the URL, you know, whether I want to have a Twitter feed next to it, what thumbnail I want to show for the live feed, what people I want to see the live feed, so I can decide what groups within the media library I want to see this thing as well, and whether I want to schedule the event to be available at a certain time or always be available. Then what I do is that's running now. If I go back to my library, and I go to live now, and I go to Rob's live stream, there we go. So we're streaming live right now, well, with a little bit of latency. So it's going to be a little bit. I mean, apologies, you know, my five-year-old daughter's been at my iPhone and probably dropped it into a bowl of cereal or something. But that's it. That's as easy as it is to do a live event. And that application for your phone is called the, uh, the GoCoder. Then what happens is, after the live event's finished, we go into Medial and it archives the live event here. So this will pop into our little view here and it will encode the live stream because I've clicked stop on this. I've clicked stop. So it's gone off to the, the medial server and it will start to archive that clip into the category that I defined, which was the streaming limited live archive, bit wordy. And you'll see all of the content that I've produced here, well, that one is. But you'll see here, there's a variety of different, there's Dave as well, doing his live stream, six minute live stream. You're just looking at yourself. <laughs> <laughs> checking himself out. <laughs> You'll see there's a ton of live streams here that we've recorded, all with a variety of different devices. So, and different en encoders, yeah. There's a, lot, there's a lot of kind of testing stuff in there that we've done in that particular category. So, it comes in, ooh, it archives it off. No, it's not come in just yet, but it will come in. It's probably a bit of a slow internet connection. It will come in, it will archive it off, and then it's available in the library. So the point here is that if you want to use your existing technology that you've got, we were talking about these TriCasters, Teradec, all this stuff that you've already got, with this, you can, you can do it. You're just getting the information that is here within the live stream page, and you're putting that into your encoder. So to give you an example, you know, this is a freebie one. I mean, it's not going to work because it's on my Mac, but this is one from Adobe called the Flash Media Encoder. You would basically put the information from Medial into here, right? So we give you a, a streaming server name and we give you a name of the stream, and then you just click go, and that's it. It's working. So you don't necessarily have to have all of this fancy kit that you paid loads and loads of money for. You could do it from a phone. You, I mean, I'm not saying you'd pay lots and lots of money for all this stuff, but you know, if you haven't got something that does it, equally you could do it from a phone. That same app is on an iPad, it's on Android as well, so it's you know, whatever device you've got, and it works, pretty cool. So that's, that's live, that's how it works. Uh, where are we? Right, let's go back to my PowerPoint. So it's just a slide just to illustrate exactly what we're doing. We're kind of saying any input, it doesn't really matter what you've got, any encoder, as long as it works with Wowzer, which most of them do. And then we just protect the stream so you can decide who you want to see it in terms of groups. We'll archive it off and we can schedule it. And any of the devices that will play this back as well. So it's kind of creating this very neat live streaming workflow for you if, if you don't have that already. And I was speaking to a, a chap in the, in the break about this. And it is, you know, this live streaming stuff is, is all about the playback page. People, 
I, you know, they all say, I can get that encoder working, I can click on the button and get that bit working. I can get it working with the streaming server because that's just some settings. But what I can't do and I can't figure out is how I create this playback page to get it working. So we're doing that bit for you because you just grab the embed code and put it somewhere else. And then the archiving after the event, even today, the software that I'm using today, we're starting and stopping it and then we're recording a file that we're then going to upload to YouTube and Medial. If we were live streaming this event, which we're not today, um, that would be pushing it to our Medial and then it would archive it when we click stop. So in theory, if I was live streaming it today, I'm not, I apologize for that. I could even have said to you, well, when you're on the train on the way home, if you'll want to watch it back, I'm sure you wouldn't, <laughs> especially after a couple of gin and tonics as well, um, then you, you potentially could because it would have been there in our medial in a category. I mean, I'll hope to do that next year, but you know, it all depends on the connectivity going out of the venue, really. So that's live streaming. And there's a video on live streaming as well. Another one, you might have spotted me in that video. I don't know whether you're in that video, are you? No, Dave's in the medial one, the back of his head anyway. <laughs> so, uh, the next one is uh, webcam capture. So, this is in the, the, the portal product and also in the LTI integration. So, most people will be familiar with the two tiles that upload new media item and choose media item. We've now got the record webcam icon as well uh, and it also appears in the upload wizard within the portal product as well so you can record from your webcam I said earlier that if you click on browse on an iPad or a you know a tablet device then you're generally going to get to record yourself anyway but through a browser you'd get to record from your webcam what does it look like this um, so you get to choose your input just here um, you get a level of your microphone and you can record video or audio. So I've spoken to a couple of people in the break that were saying that a lot of time people just want to record audio. They don't really want to record video. So you can record one or the other. And then you can do a little bit of uh, cropping. I don't think I've got a screenshot of the cropping actually. You can do some cropping of the, the video or the audio as well and then uh, uh, upload that particular item. So you'll probably also notice that we've kind of switched it around now so that you upload the video first and then you put the metadata in, whereas before we didn't do that. We've kind of, we've kind of done it the other way around, so you're uploading the file first. Another thing that we've also done, I don't think I've got this as a slide in this presentation. I think I've missed it out. But for a student upload within Moodle, we've cut down the amount of tabs because we were finding that people were just saying, oh, you know, students can't be bothered to fill out all this stuff. So I think we've cut it down to, th is it three tabs now, isn't it? It's not, it's not many. Yeah, I think there's a lot of associated files. That's and, it. Uh, I think the thumbnail is... Thumbnail's auto-selected, auto isn't it? Yeah. So we've cut down the amount of tabs that you've got to go through because people were just finding it was just too much for students to do. Improvements. So the first thing to say, just on a kind of technical point of view is we now support Windows Server 2012 whereas we were lagging behind a bit with 2008 for quite a long time so now you can install this on 2012 so I found a lot of the people that I've spoken to about um, their upgrade for Medial as they've kind of said yeah 
kind of see it as an opportune time to put it on some new hardware and go for 2012 rather than 2008. Or people that are installing it from new would obviously go for 2012 right away. We have a, this slide is really to illustrate that we've got a new installer updater application. So whereas before we had an installer, you'd install the product and then we had an updater that you'd update it. The, it, it didn't really work very well because what the installer used to do is install the product on version one and then the updater would update it to the current version. And what we found was comically, I mean, this did happen on a few occasions. Some of our customers had installed the product on version one and hadn't upgraded it. So they'd come back and say, wow, it really doesn't look that great. You know, it looks pretty old. And you're like, what? And then you can realize they're on version one and you have to get them to upgrade. Whereas this will now install, update, uninstall. It'll do the whole lot all in one application. So it'll be super easy in the future because anyone that wants to install it from scratch can use the same application as to update it. And when you want to update it, we'll give you an update. You run it, it will update it fine, done and dusted, easy peasy. The other thing that you'll notice here, and I'll come on to talk about this later, is you can install either a full medial instance, which is what the vast majority of people here today have got, or a transcoder instance. The transcoder instance is just the one that, that does the conversion of the media files only. It won't, it, it's just uh, by means of scaling medial. And I'll, I've, I've got a whole different presentation on that, but that's just one thing that people might have asked a question on. The transcoding, while we're on the subject of that, the performance has improved a lot. Um, we've gone away from using the Helix producer, which is what we used to use before, for obvious reasons that you know we're not really hitching our wagon to the Helix thing anymore. Um, I would say, pessimistically, it will be at least a third quicker, at, at the very least, probably double the speed, actually, in most of the tests we've done. It will depend on the type of content that you've got, you know, how compressed, uncompressed it is. But it will, I mean, I, I wouldn't say it will definitely be faster because I don't think I could ever promise anything like that. But 95% it will be faster than what you, than what you would have had with uh, version 3. Version 3.1 had the new encoder in it anyway. So if you're on 3.1, you're probably already seeing some speed enhancement. Or did it have it optionally? So that had it optionally, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. optional. OK. Lots of people will have that already. The other thing as well, I get asked for this a lot. I'm not an expert on uh, transcoding, um, although I'm regularly pulled into discussions about it. Um, so there's a lot of people that are our customers that really do know a lot about this subject. So it's all to do with uh, different profiles. So at the moment, what we have, when you upload a file, it do a, a low, uh, a medium, and, and a HD version of it, if you uploaded a HD file. All of these particular profiles, we call them, they have lots of different settings in them. They're different bit rates, so the quality of the video, different resolutions, how big the video looks, different frame rates, different, I mean, the list goes on. There's probably about 20 or 30 different things that you can change. What we find is, is that we get a lot of people saying to us, well, uh, you know, they know better than us, and we should change this, and we should do that, and you know, this, this is what we should do with the transcoding. With the Helix producer way of doing it, these, these, uh, these are just text files that sit on the medial server that you can edit. With the Helix producer way of doing it, it was very hard to edit this because the file that we're looking at here, this profile file, was called a .rpad file, weird format, but in it, it had very few things you could edit. I mean, almost nothing. Whereas this has a lot more flexibility. I mean, we were kind of using a command line before that would then call this file almost for the last bit. This really has all of the options in it. So the point I'm trying to make is, is if you have better ideas on what we have and you, you think that you know the HD should be more bit rate or this frame rate's rubbish and I want to change this, whatever, let us know because you know we can't support absolutely every configuration under the sun. But if there's a good reason to change it, then we can change it through editing these, or you could change it. So I already have a couple of people that have messed around with this and have, have got some decent output and have gone much, much higher on the HD and you know, have played around with it. And they, you could, yeah. 
I mean, I would say, I mean, I don't want it to be a landslide of people changing and messing about with this stuff, but I would say if you're going to change it, let us know what you intend to do because it's sort of, it's whether we can support it or not ongoing. We, we have to be a little bit careful of these things, which is why we haven't really exposed this through the user interface because Some it... Some things are for one-offs, it doesn't really matter. You yeah. Don't it quite a bit manually anyway. Yeah, you could do, it's but... something you're going to do on a regular basis. It's... It's, it's, tri it's tricky for us to say exactly what we could support. What we do with the transcoding side of things is we, we actually subcontract it out to a, a guy that knows absolutely everything about it, right? That would, could write pages and pages <laughs> of content on this particular subject. So we would generally pass it by him and say, look, is this going to work ongoing as a streaming file through uh, a media player, through a streaming server, et cetera, et cetera, and just OK it? Because what we wouldn't want to do is for somebody to do it in a certain way, and then a year down the line, it then doesn't work. And we're like, well, you're going to have to re-encode all of that lot. So we don't profess to be absolute experts in transcoding. I know a lot about the subject just having had lots of questions about it but it is something that we kind of refer to a higher authority on, I would say. But it's there. There is more flexibility than what there was before. The other thing that we did is now, if you want to, I know there's a few people that use this where they'll say um, they want to upload content as an administrator, but then they want to assign it to a particular person. So there might be a particular person that says, oh, I don't know how to use all this newfangled web stuff. I, uh, but I've got this content. Can you upload it for me and then put it in my personal category so I can then use it in Moodle or Blackboard? So we have the ability to do that. You click on this little little man icon or little head or whatever you want to call it. Click on that and then you can assign it to a particular person, which is useful. You know, pe people have used that for sure. Um, before, I mean, this was a bit of a shortcoming really. We didn't have this kind of um, percentage encoding thing going on in your content list. We would do it as not very dynamically, so we would either just have a yes or a no, or we'd increment up like 30%, 60%, etc. Now this is totally dynamic, so you'll see when you upload something, it will increment up a percentage point at a time, and you'll see the progress of it. This was a real frustration for new users of our system. We would just say, well, I don't know whether it's working or not. I'm not, not too sure. Whereas this is very dynamic, it's all, you know, it, the page doesn't need to refresh or anything like that. This just works through, through the browser as you see it. So you'll see this going on uh, straight away. Uh, another thing that we changed was this copy link uh, URL that was on the page before. What it used to do is it used to go to the page within Medial. So if you copied that link, it would direct to the actual page in Medial that would have your header, your embed code, all the stuff around it. And what we found was people kept saying, not that they didn't like the Medial interface, but they were basically saying, look, I just want it to have the media player on it. I don't want it to have all of this stuff around it because it's confusing to users. So we've changed it now so that that link, when you copy and paste it, it will just show you a page with the media player on it, and that's it. And it's a totally responsive player as well. So if you resize the browser, it will resize the media player as well. The other cool thing, we changed the upload control. We added a couple more formats as well, I think. 3GP was one of the ones we added, and you can upload M4V now as well, because that was one that people were always saying, oh, I've got to change it to an MP4 before I upload it, so we changed that. The other thing now about the new upload control is that it will actually resume upload after reconnecting to the internet. So say you know, we had this quite a lot with big files, people would be uploading something enormous, something would interrupt their internet connection, they'd go, oh, I was 80% through a two gig upload and it, it's failed and I've got to do it again. This is intelligent enough to recognize the fact that you've already uploaded 80%. And then it'll carry on from 80% when you try again. So it's, it's pretty cool in that respect. So it, it doesn't really matter if it fails. You know that you can go back and upload again. And it's slightly, it looks slightly different as well, the upload control, just so that, so that you know, so that you're not freaked out by it when, when you try it. This was asked for a lot. So increasing the upload limit before we were restricted to 2 gigs. Now you can go as high as 100 gigs if you want to. Um, 
One thing to be aware of about uploading a 100 gig file, one, it will take a while, and two, it will take a while to transcode it because a 100 gig file is gonna be not compressed at all. So we're gonna have to do a lot of number crunching to get that down to the right size. That said, I have a lot of people that will tell me, yeah, I regularly get files that are 10 gigs, I regularly get files that are five gigs, and I wanna upload those. So you don't have a restriction over that anymore. You can upload anything up to 100 gigs. I would be inclined not to allow 100 gig uploads if it was me, but up to you. And then our embed code now is, is fully responsive. Before it was kind of responsive is probably the best way of putting it. Now, if you embed uh, some content somewhere and you are putting it in a platform that you need it to be responsive, then it, it will be. The, the media player responds to um, different widths and heights. Before, it was kind of a bit of a workaround to do it. Now it is fully responsive. And we're using the JW Player 6 now. We were using JW Player 5 before. I was just talking to somebody in the break. JW Player 7 is now out, so we're going to have to take a look at that for maybe a bug fix of uh, version 4. This was one of the ones that Michael raised earlier in his presentation. So students before, all that they could do within Moodle and Blackboard is they could upload a piece of content. That was it. They had no access at all to a kind of repository of content that they'd already uploaded. Now, if you want them to, it's, you know, it's your choice whether you want them to do this, um, they can select from a, a bank of personal media that they've uploaded already to either Medial or Blackboard or Moodle. Improvements with Blackboard and Moodle. So um, I talked about it earlier with a lot of the use of this on the iPad, for example. We found that the launch pop-up that comes up had a lot of scrolling within it. It was quite a long, sort of ungainly thing. So we've squished it up a lot. So it, it really just appears as is with, with no scrolling involved at all. The reason why is things like the iPad, if you're trying to scroll a window within a window, I mean, it's almost impossible to do it. So we, we just cut everything down. We cut the size of it down. We've cut down the amount of steps and just made it a lot easier to use. And then the feedback plugin, as we was talking uh, about it with Michael earlier on his presentation, you're going to be able to give feedback to a video that's been submitted through Moodle. So completing that Moodle workflow. Um, you can decide the kind of custom text when people come into uh, LTI, into uh, Moodle or Blackboard. So when they click to come into the tool for the first time, what a lot of people will know f through having used the, the system is that you can define what you want it to say. So if you're using Blackboard or Moodle with, our, um, with Medial and you want people to log in using AD the first time so you can pair them to an account within Medial, you can put up whatever prompt you like to say, please log in using your, I don't know, University of XYZ username or password because a lot of organizations have different terminology for Active Directory or University of the Highlands, you know, whatever you call your internal authentication system. So we've got that. I think you can put, can you put HTML in that and images and that sort of stuff? I think yeah, you can, can't you? you? Yeah. Yeah. So you could put what you like in there, even if it's images or you know, whatever you want to put in there, just so that it's a very simple process. Our default text just says that this is a one-time process. You won't have to do it again. We've made the login box much smaller as well, because we were finding, again, when people were presented with that in Moodle, there was some scrolling going on dependent on how, how their Moodle was set up. So we've made it really small, so it always fits within a very small space. You can say, you know, if you're using the methodology of not allowing them access through AD, you can say, give them a question, yes or no, and you can decide what that question is. And then you can just define what all the text says once they've submitted their media, you know, give them an expectation. You've submitted this, it will take a day, or it will take a few minutes, or whatever you want to put, you can put in there. So it gives you a lot more uh, flexibility to put what you want on entry and on exit as well. So again, within Moodle, there's loads of different things that go on there. We found um, with students, for example, within Moodle, what we found was is students would submit a video as a response to an assignment. They would then, uh, the video would be added to the page within Moodle. 
and then the student wouldn't click save within Moodle on the page and then it wouldn't submit the assignment. So they, the student would say, well, I did it. I uploaded it. I, it's, you know, it's your fault. It's your fault. So what we did is we created it so that when the window shuts and the student has submitted the assignment, you can put a delay on there. A delay for like five seconds or ten seconds or whatever. And you can display a message that says, by the way, you haven't submitted this until you click save at the bottom of the page. And you can put images and text and whatever you like to appear in that window. And then the window shuts. And then they've got no excuse to click save. Because people were coming to us with this and saying, well, the students were confused by this. And we were kind of saying, well, look, this is a Moodle thing, not really a medial thing. It's not, they, they should know that they've got to click save in Moodle. But then we were kind of like, well, we can do something to mitigate that. We can at least delay the closure of that window and tell them to do something. So you can do that as well. And within Blackboard, for example, sometimes the, the, for whatever reason, security, or there's lots of different things that go on, sometimes the window wouldn't shut. And they wanted to display a message to say, look, if this window doesn't shut, contact Blackboard support department or whatever your Blackboard support team are called within your organization. That is a bit of a rarity. That barely ever happens with Blackboard. But certainly within Moodle, there are these things within Moodle that people kind of say, oh, well, it's misleading and it's this and it's that. And we have to do a lot around that to make it work properly. So that's, that's the configuration setting within the actual plugin that allows you to determine the number of seconds that it would delay for before it shuts down. So you put a value in there. I can't remember. I think if you want it to auto-close, what is it? Minus one? Is that or is that the, to disable it? Minus one. Minus one. OK, cool. So that's, that's in the setting screen of the Moodle plugin if you want to do that. I mean, ours, our demo system doesn't do that, but that's just us using it. You might want to do that within yours if you've got students complaining and using it in that way. Blackboard, again, the same sort of thing. We eliminate the scrolling within the, pay, uh, within the little window that comes up because of those reasons, because you know, people were finding it confusing that they have to scroll and they might not necessarily need to see the next button dependent on their screen resolution. We fix loads of bugs relating to browsers, even though Blackboard itself apparently doesn't work in Internet Explorer. That's what I'm told. <laughs> we still have to fix all the bugs within IE for some reason, even though theirs doesn't work. Custom exit message. And obviously, all this other stuff that I talked about, inclusion of the webcam capture and inclusion of the student selection of content, is also within Blackboard as well as Moodle. And that's it. That's V4.